for that warm welcome. Um, I first need to begin by following our indigenous protocols and acknowledge the custodians and ancestors of the land. It is an honor to be here in the homeland of the uh, Pueblo Nations, as well as the Diné and Apache peoples, and to be asked to chair this distinguished panel. I want to thank um, the School for Advanced Research, the IARC, Daniel and Alicia for organizing this wonderful event. And it is my um, pleasure to have an opportunity to share the stage with these wonderful um, leaders um, in the museum, in the museum field. Um, what, we were, what we're going to do today um, is provide some general introductions initially. As you know, the topic is on um, exploring narratives within the context of tribal museums. And it's really exciting to have three of the finest leaders in um, tribal museums, tribal cultural centers here at the SAR. Um, and so what I'd like to do is to ask them to provide a bit of context on their particular institution. And the reason why I, I think this is also very helpful is sometimes when I attend panels, um, when people begin with just kind of with the questions, just throwing out the questions and then people start to respond, Sometimes there's some context that is missing for you guys to help, for the audience to really fully understand, I think, the, um, the points that are being made. So what I wanted to do in order to get us to this kind of shared understanding about the significance of these three important cultural centers um, is to have each of the um, panelists present very briefly about their institution and then we'll... Um, and they'll entertain some questions that I developed, and then we're going to open the floor up to all of you. Um, but first, some introductions. Uh, Janine uh, Ledford is the executive director of the McCall Cultural and Research uh, Center, excuse me, a position she has held since 1995. As the director, she oversees the McCall Language Program, the Archives and Library, the Education Department, and Curation and Exhibits. Ms. Ledford is also the uh, Macaw Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. She lives on the Macaw Reservation with her four children, one of whom is a student at Stanford University. Go Cardinal. Even though I went to Berkeley, I still love Stanford. Um, she is the author of several uh, publications, including a chapter in the book, Coming to Shore, Northwest Coast Ethnology, Traditions, and Visions. And this book was edited by Marie Maas, Michael Harkin, and Sergi Khan. Now, uh, Ms. Ledford is also serves on the uh, Washington State Governor's Advisory Council for Historic Preservation, is the chairperson for the National Association for Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, and is the chairperson for the Macaw Tribes Higher Education Committee. Our next panelist is um, Manuelito Manny Wheeler, and Manny is named after the distinguished Diné leader Manuelito. And he is the director of the Navajo Nation Museum in Window Rock, Arizona, and he has held this, uh, that position since 2008. Born and raised in the Navajo Nation, Wheeler is deeply concerned with um, language and cultural preservation efforts. And this commitment led to Manny working on a three-year project to have Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope, translated into Diné. And in July 2013, the dubbing was complete, and the film premiered the following September at the Navajo Nation Fair. So I look forward to learning more about that project as well. And our final panelist today is Travis Zimmerman. And Travis is, a descendant, uh, Travis is a descendant of the Grand Portage Band of Ojibwe, and he is a veteran of the U.S. Army and the Minnesota National Guards. Travis has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in History from St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, and is currently the site manager of the Mille Lacs Indian Museum and Trading Post and the Indian Affairs Liaison for the Minnesota Historical Society, where he has been employed for over seven years. And Travis has been involved with American Indian nonprofits in Minnesota for the last 20 years, serving as a staff member and board member of a dozen of organizations. And one of um, those recent projects that um, Travis has been involved with, and I've had an opportunity to actually attend a conference with him, is this wonderful new collective or organization um, called the Great Lakes Culture Keepers. And this organization um, is led by um, individuals at the University of Wisconsin at Madison's Library and Information School. And the organization brings together 
um, tribal museum professionals and archivists and librarians in the Great, Lake reg Great Lakes region for workshops, leadership institutes. And Travis has graciously agreed to host the next gathering at the um, Mille Lacs Indian Museum this April. So that is really, as I said, a really exciting development um, in the Native American museum world. So with that said, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Travis, have Travis start and provide again that kind of brief introduction, if you will, on his institution that kind of helps us get to that shared knowledge base as we delve in deeper to exploring narratives in tribal museums. Well, thank you, Amy, and thank you all for being here. And um, it's an honor to, to be presenting here today. This is the first time I've been at the, uh, the SAR here. I've been in Santa Fe several times, but never been here. So it's a great opportunity to, to check out your campus. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Mille Lacs Indian Museum and Trading Post, which out of our three institutions is probably uh, um, a quasi-tribal museum because we are part of the Minnesota Historical Society, but we've always been accepted in the tribal museum community because of the story we tell, and we're located on the Mille Lacs Indian Reservation uh, in north central Minnesota. And uh, the site, I'll give you a little background, then I got some pictures of the museum here that I'll kind of walk you through. Um, but the site started as a trading post in 1918. Uh, it was run by a couple, Henry and Jeanette Ayers, who were originally were, were from Pennsylvania, uh, moved to St. Paul, and then eventually moved up to the Mille Lacs Indian Reservation and started uh, the trading post. They ran a trading post there uh, for 40 some years and in 1959, they donated the land, the buildings, um, and most importantly, a collection of over 2,000 Ojibwe objects that Hen Henry Ayer had collected uh, to the Minnesota Historical Society. So when the Minnesota Historical Society opened it up, they originally had a small museum that it, they attached to the back of the trading post. Uh, they tore that down in 1992, and in 1996, we opened a... Uh, 20,000 square foot uh, modern museum that uh, I think is, I'm a little biased, but <laughs> I think it's one of the nicer uh, museums in the nation. Um, and uh, so uh, as a historical society, um, the story we tell and the way it was uh, designed, the, the museum is that they really, and as you can see in the pictures, they really went out into the community. They had several different advisory committees, elders advisory committees, that type of thing, that uh, came together and they made sure to include uh, band members' voices throughout the exhibit. So this first slide we have uh, when you come into our, our main uh, exhibit area of the museum is we have this collage of different, uh, you know, life-size photographs of all different band members, um, you know, from different ages, different time periods, that type of thing that kind of greet you, talk a little bit about uh, who we are as Ojibwe or Anishinaabe or Chippewa, you know, we kind of go through that and explain the differences of the name and, and who we, what we call ourselves. Mm -hmm. the next one. Um, this was just a little panel that I thought was, was pretty neat because these panels that we have in the main part of the museum uh, not only do we have them in English, these little sayings, but then on the flip side of all these, they also have all this in Ojibwe. So uh, throughout the museum, we do try to incorporate a lot of Ojibwe language. Um, this is just uh, one of our exhibits called uh, a Living Culture. And in this exhibit, we talk about uh, powwows, we talk about language. We just, uh, you know, talk about how a lot of these traditions and cultures are still alive and still being practiced. And the, one of the neat things about this is that um, all the outfits in our exhibit area for living culture, all the different uh, powwow outfits were made specifically for uh, this exhibit for the museum. Um, this is uh, Modern Warriors. This is our, our veterans honor wall. And you see that more and more in a lot of tribal museums now that, you know, we go out of our way to honor our veterans. And here we not only list the names of veterans from the Mille Lacs Band, we also have a little, um, their dodame or their clan uh, symbol next to that. And then we have uh, photographs of their, their military, in their military attire to, to go with it. 
Uh, this is a section called Nation Within a Nation within our main exhibit, and uh, here we talk about uh, sovereignty, uh, treaties, that sort of thing. And if you're not familiar with the Mille Lacs Band, uh, one of the things that they're known for is in 1999, they won a Supreme Court case reaffirming their hunting and fishing rights. That really had a ripple effect, I think, throughout Indian country. And then this is a, a picture of uh, some of the different leaders of the Mille Lacs Band, starting from all the way on the, the left here, uh, Shabashdung, and going to um, uh, up until the... Uh, um, the, the last one you see there on the right is Marge Anderson, who just passed away here a couple years ago. But uh, she was instrumental in, in developing a lot of the gaming and um, the separation of powers within the, the council here. So. And then that's, a, again, a picture of Marge and, and our living culture. So today, the, the museum, uh, we, we have a, the museum, but we also run an active trading post. So we still run the trading post like it's been ran for the last 100 years. We buy and sell American Indian Arts and Crafts, not only just from uh, local band members and people throughout the region, but we go to the herd, um, the Santa Fe Indian Art Market, different things, and we are constantly looking for artists to, to bring back uh, their artwork to sell at the trading post. And so um, we even trade with artists. A lot of artists we have come in. We have a lot of craft supplies at the trading post, so we will actively trade if they bring in pieces and they want to trade for craft supplies, and we, we trade with them and different things. So we get about uh, 13,000 visitors uh, to our museum each year, and um, we do different workshops, and I'll get into some of this other stuff as we go through the questions, but I just wanted to share a little bit about our museum. As Amy mentioned, my name is Janine Ledford. I was here yesterday talking, and I know some of you were here yesterday, so it's nice to have you back. Um, thanks so much for, for the invitation and for, for being here with us. So I am from the Macaw tribe. This is Washington State, and we're located right here at the very northwest tip of the state. Um, a lot of people think Bellingham is the northwest part of Washington that's up this way by Canada, but we think of this as the northwest tip because you're as far west as you can get. We look north to Vancouver Island, and then um, west, of course, to the, out to the Pacific Ocean. And we're culturally related to people um, in Canada on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Linguistically, we're not really related to anybody else in the United States. Um, so this shows our traditional territory and um, our current reservation. Um, five villages were traditionally um, lived in by the Macaw uh, during the winter time. There were seasonal villages, seasonal camps that people went to to put up a lot of food, and two of them are located right here in the main town of Nia Bay, up on this end of town and right down through here. Um, and our museum is here, so this is just shows you an aerial photograph of Nia Bay, which is the main town now on the Macaw, on the Macaw Reservation. So that's where the school is, where the bulk of the people live, we have a nice new marina. That's one of the other bigger developments is this marina that provides safe moorage for our fishermen throughout the year. And that's a really great um, addition to our place. So this shows the west coast, the ocean side. This is Macaw Bay here. This area is called Macaw Bay. And then um, this starting down here is where you get into the national park. So we're bordered on the south by the Olympic National Park. I'll talk a little bit about the excavation that happened out here. Um, this is the lake, is actually is Lake Ozette. And so um, two of the villages were located right here within sight, um, one up, up this way and then actually one down this way. And then the furthest one south would be down at Ozette. And that's where we did a big ex excavation, archeological excavation in the 1970s. Um, so this is the site. It's on the outer coast of Washington State. We excavated um, in collaboration with Washington State University. So even though it's located, um, it's removed from our, the main body of our reservation, we do own one square mile of land down there. So I think of it as kind of a satellite part of our reservation. Unlike a lot of places, the bulk of our land on the Macaw Reservation is owned by the tribe or allotted to individual tribal members. And then we have little parcels like this to the south, and Ozette is one of them. And um, what happened here, 
at about 1700 or before, a mudslide came down and covered a portion of the Ozette village and really preserved for centuries all, the, uh, all of the contents of those houses, of several houses, as well as the houses themselves. And so the tribal council asked Washington State University to basically um, take care of some things that were coming out of the bank, and then it turned into this big 11-year long excavation where we removed 55,000 artifacts. And um, we care for all of those artifacts at the Macaw Cultural and Research Center. And um, also a lot of um, elders were involved in the excavation. Um, they helped identify the artifacts, describe what the tools were used for, how they were made. We have men here that are handling sealing and whaling gear. Both of these men were, um, were seal hunters when they were younger. And so in the 1970s, they were still very um, healthy and able to explain a lot about the collection. And other, other macaws did too. And then we also had, interestingly, a component. And so the excavation, it was field school students from all over the country. But lots of young macaws were involved. And I think I have a picture of that just coming up. But other elders. Um, of course, we're, we're very involved, not just going to the site, but identifying the artifacts in the lab, doing recordings, helping with the planning of our museum. They, they gave input from the exterior of the building to the you know, exhibits themselves, how they should be laid out, what should be included. So from the very beginning, there was a lot of community involvement. And then through the last, through the 35 years, we've really tried to make sure that we maintain that notion of community ownership, that everybody needs to help out in some way, that everybody, whether it's helping stack chairs or you know, do recordings, um, <clears throat> that, that macaws really feel like this place is, um, is, is ours, is all of ours, not just belonging to the board members or the staff members, but really to the whole tribe. So this is an outside, the, um, this shows the entrance to the museum, but it's not a brand new picture. We did a neat project where we have some murals out in the front now, and I should have included one of those newer ones, but, and that was a really nice project funded by a local um, foundation in Seattle called the Potlatch Fund. And um, this shows the, um, the first part. When you come in, we come, bring visitors into this, um, the lower gallery, which is the spring. So we bring visitors through different seasonal activities and in the springtime um, and in the fall is the time for hunting whales. And this whale actually was not excavated at Ozette, but this is a whale that we hunted in 1999. So um, the school kids, the Nia Bay school kids, treated that skeleton. They buried it and sunk it and scrubbed it and sunk it again and, um, because they have to draw all the oils out of it so that it doesn't smell. Otherwise, you do a cast or something. But this is the, this is the original skeleton that we do have on display. And... Um, a few replicas, so these big canoes are replicas, a sealing canoe and a whaling canoe. And the other pieces, of course, are fragile because they're 500 years old, 300 years old, so they're behind glass. And so we have things like, this is a whale saddle here that's really a one-of-a-kind piece. It's inlaid with over 700 sea otter teeth. Um, it's, just an, it's just a treasure, an absolute treasure. We have seal clubs here and um, just incredibly well-preserved um, artifacts that are on display and that are very, um, that were done um, with, a, you know, the input of an outside exhibit designer, but with a team of macaw people really guiding the whole process. We also have, of course, first-person narrative inside on the text panels as well. So you're going through and looking at things and, and being guided by a macaw voice as we go. So the Macaw Cultural and Research Center, as Amy mentioned, includes a Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And so our Tribal Historic Preservation Office manages cultural sites on reservation. And one of the places that we get to go to is a place like this, Tattoosh Island. It's about a half mile offshore. It's the very tip of Cape Flattery. So, so many people come to Nia Bay and hike out to this point. Did you go there, Amy, when you were there probably to Nia Bay? And you can look out at this island. It's a beautiful island with this historic lighthouse. And then um, traditionally, Macaws would come in on the beach, oh, right over here, I guess, on this side. And um, that was one of the places where they could get, un get away from the eyes of the Indian agent and hold potlatches because it wasn't very easy to get to. So during one period, they did retreat there. Um, another thing that our Tribal Historic Preservation Office does, of course, is manage uh, cultural sites that are off-reservation and in conjunction with other agencies. So this 
These petroglyphs are um, south of the village of Ozette in, on area on land that is actually owned by the Olympic National Park now, so we have to work real closely with our, with our federal agencies that are neighboring us to make sure that these sites are um, properly managed. So you're looking at whales and some other things. Um, this just gives me a, a quick cue to talk about the archive. So we have an archive and a library, so we collect historic documents, of course, published um, works, um, unpublished manuscripts, field notes, because there's so much in those field notes that are really valuable to our tribe. You know, the publications are good, and, but there's so many other things that those early ethnographers were collecting that, really, that are really important. This is a Commissioner of Indian Affairs report just describing the importance of whale hunting, and then one of the few photographs of um, a whale hunting scene. Um, other his, just wonderful historic photographs. So we use these in, you know, for exhibits here and there. The high school has a wonderful his photograph exhibit front that we've put together that the high school principal wanted to have up. So we work really closely with our school kids. And um, let's see, we're just about through here. We in in the 90s built a storage facility after we um, sort of settled the question of legal ownership of the collection. So we have an 8,100 square foot storage facility where the bulk of the collection is stored. Again, 55,000 artifacts from us that were excavated and we only display 500 of them. So we have to have a good storage facility with environmental controls and fire suppression and all, all those important things. And then we manage it, and I talked about it yesterday and we really won't today, but within a system that preserves cultural values rather than erodes them, so it's a really unique way that we manage the collection as well. And um, as I mentioned, we have just a few, um, just a small percent, just about 1% of the of the collection on display. So this is a piece that I think is in storage, actually, this beaver, it's a beaver tooth chisel with just a beautiful carved face there. And um, another thing that we, where we focus the bulk of our attention um, is our language program. So in the MCRC opened, the Macaw Cultural and Research Center opened in 1979, and in, um, since then, actually before then, in 1978, the tribe declared Macaw the official language of the tribe, and um, so we've really focused the bulk of our efforts to revitalizing the language, and um, so we work with preschool kids all the way through adults. We have eight certified language teachers. Um, we work with the public school, so it's a state school, and so the tribe and the state figure out ways to make sure that the school kids have language lessons, um, most of them twice a week for about an hour each time, and we're seeing real improvements in their academic success that sort of correlates with the amount of language that they have. So that's really, really neat. And they love to come over and they love to have the teachers there. Sometimes I have, I have two elementary school kids and I'll ask them what their favorite thing was today. And usually when it's the day they had language, I said, my language teacher was here today. And they just absolutely love it. So we're really excited about working with the working with the kids. So although it's a museum displaying a priceless collection, again, so much of what we do revolves around cultural preservation. So that's what I've got. Thanks. Okay. Next. All right. Um, my name is, uh, I'm going to step aside because the light's right in my eyes, and I can't see if any of you are falling asleep, so I know when to stop. Um, my name is Manuel Ito Wheeler. I'm the director of the Navajo Nation Museum. Um, prior to being at the Navajo Nation Museum, I was at the Herd Museum for 10 years, over 10 years, and I started as a carpenter's assistant, and then I rose through the ranks to become their creative director. So uh, when the Navajo Nation Museum directorship position opened up, then that's how I ended up back home. And um, I, I was uh, born and raised on the Navajo Nation. So uh, I spent a, a large amount of my time in Wonder Rock, which is where the museum is at now. The Navajo Nation Museum uh, was opened in 1961. And what's interesting uh, about that is I'm the first uh, native director for the museum. The, the prior they had uh, non-native as, as their director which I think speaks to um, how Native people treat museums and how they think about museums. Uh, I think we, uh, we, hate, we have a love-hate relationship with museums. You know? um, on one hand, we view museums as uh, 
grave robbers and they've taken our stuff. But then on the other hand, they, we need a museum to preserve our history and culture. You know? So it kind of has this, this dual role that um, we play in, in, a, in our communities. So what our take home message and what my take home message is, is um, messing up everything you think you know about us and also messing up everything we think we know about ourselves and then letting us rebuild um, what that is. So I, I have a tremendous amount of experience with exhibit development. I, was, uh, I worked with exhibit designers, I did exhibit designing, I did exhibit building. So, um, so that's something that comes easy to me. It's something that I've always longed for were um, experiences, I don't want to say exhibits, I want to say experiences that helped everybody, Native and non-Native, uh, understand, have a, have a deeper and more human, more loving understanding of, of who we all are. So, um, myself as a director, I, I don't focus on the collection. You know, we're not a collection-focused uh, museum. However, we do have collections, we take good care of them, uh, and I have a curator, we have a staff of um, eight, and uh, that, that's not including me, nine including me. And um, so, you know, when I came on board, especially after working at the herd, I really kind of got our exhibits in, in order. We had a fantastic building. Since we've been there since um, 1961, the museum has moved to three different places. And then the one we we're in now was uh, we moved in 1996 or 98, depending on who you ask. 96, the building was open. It was held politically hostage for two years and didn't open until 1998. So um, the exhibits, you know, uh, the exhibits were not where I wanted them to be, especially coming from the herd and having that professional exhibit experience. So as soon as I got on board, you know, I'm like, yeah, we're going to get all our exhibits. And that was done within a year, you know. And I was proud of that and proud of my staff because really helped um, hone their skills and that's something that I'm proud to say that our exhibits are 100% done from start to finish in-house from the graphic design to the curation to the research to the building everything so that's something that you know whether it's you know it's Smithsonian quality you know it's irrelevant because it's, it's we did it and uh, even in it, it's it's where at a point where I find um, acceptable. And some of our exhibits have really been um, phenomenal. So after that, uh, we started to explore, um, experiment with different avenues, take more risk. That's ultimately what it uh, came to. And um, one of them, we'll go ahead and um, play, I'll play a couple of minutes of this. This is a project we worked with uh, the state of New Mexico, um, Il a, a group called ILSAF and the Malamation Group. So you can go in and play that, and it has audio to it too. So.
Okay, so uh, one of the projects that um, we worked with, we ended up um, working with uh, partnering, partnering uh, Ai Weiwei with the Navajo artist. And that was uh, one of our, our biggest projects. So um, that, that was a long time coming. And again, we worked with the state of New Mexico and uh, the Food Call Hotel. So um, this is a, a small snippet of the, of the piece that happened. And it was really phenomenal, and it, it um, gained a lot of uh, attention internationally for for everybody. And um, you know, when I went to uh, talk with Ai Weiwei, you know, he he it was it wasn't a question for him. It was like, yes, you know, I want to do this. And he he asked like, how would this help though? What what is, what is the purpose? And for me, the purpose was. Again, to um, it's not the byproduct is gaining exposure for Navajo artists. The real product is letting contemporary Navajo artists fully be appreciated for what they do. So um, I think we have the, the traditional arts covered pretty well. You know, and I, I say that for Southwest artists, probably all Native artists in the, in the country. And I think where it's at, again, redefining what you think we know about, you think you know about us, and what we think we know about ourselves. So um, this is uh, the piece by Bert Benali and uh, Ai Weiwei, and I'll just, again, show a couple of minutes of this with that. Material, so you'll see a lit design, and we'll get to the corner, and the campfires will start up. And hopefully by that time the pot will start to implode and you'll see the corn sculpture on the inside. I've been working on some songs as well that I made uh, loops and samples from old records and Native American recordings that I have. So we'll have somebody hidden in the brush back there and play the music so it'll kind of accompany the, the burn process with its general plan.
on the Navajo Nation. We're going to have to go to New York or Chicago or Milan or Hong Kong to see cool things. Um, we have a Wei here that's doing a project here on the Navajo Nation. So, you know, it's time for them to, uh, to notice and realize that things are happening and can happen and hopefully will continue to happen. Okay, in the last letter, 10 second clip here, the special project we're working on right now. Um, all I need you to do is put that to that. And that, to that. So, um, you know, some of you may have heard that we did Star Wars in Navajo, and uh, that was phenomenally successful for us. There was a uh, small group of uh, people that were against it initially, and then after uh, seeing what it did for our people, then uh, you know that changed most of their minds. There's still some people that aren't happy with what I did, but I still stand by the project and everybody that worked on it. That we did something that I, I feel strongly that uh, we shifted the course of history for uh, Navajo people. And for, I mean, that's, that's ultimately what one of the roles of, um, one of the roles of uh, a museum should be. So, um, the audio part, can you hook that up real quick? Because the audio is critical on this. Is it just this piece here to the headphones? So after we did um, Star Wars, uh, there was another project got put before us, and that's, um, well, I actually asked for it. Because after we did Star Wars, I wanted to do another movie, but do it for children. So I knew we needed to do a children's movie. And um, who else to ask for a children's movie than, than Disney? So we put the uh, question out there for Disney, and um, pretty quickly they said yes. I asked. Or they asked which one, I said, which, which one do you want? And um, they asked about, they're like, what about Pocahontas? And I'm like, um, <laughs> let's, let's do another one. And then um, they asked to do, uh, do, do other Disney movies. And then um, we kind of went back and forth a little bit. And then finally it ended up with uh, Finding Nemo. So that's what we're working on right now. And... Um, they had to ask uh, John Lasseter. And even with Star Wars, they had to ask, ask George Lucas. So it's like those are the types of events that kind of send chills up my spine that are like, they're like, okay, we're going to do this, but we've got to ask uh, George. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then, um, you know, a couple days later, they're like, yeah, George approved. And it was the same with John Lasseter. And for, to, to me, like, those are like kind of uh, heroes for me. And, um, so it's kind of unusual how the universe works. And that's how I operate as well. Um, I don't operate purely on formula. I understand, <clears throat> for me, because of my upbringing, there's other forces involved. And I kind of, um, I like to, uh, you know, pay attention to those forces. And so by listening to them, um, you know, I get up in this project with Star Wars and now so what I'm going to play here is a tiny clip of why what we're doing is like so important it's so so important and um, Finding Nemo isn't done this is a person who um, auditioned and most likely will get the part and, uh, we're working on that hopefully you can play this You'll only hear one voice. So that's what I mean by we want to do something that is going to redefine us.
to you and redefine us to ourselves. And by that, we get pride by, by, and that's another thing of our, what we do in terms of museums. We help um, build pride within our community. And through pride, uh, that there's some um, inspiration and momentum to take, to do things, do risks, to take risks. And through taking risks, there's some, um, there's growth. But there's also um, some tough times when you take risks. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I have to say. And I don't approach museums as, okay, we gotta do our exhibits, we gotta do our educational programming, and we gotta make sure people get through the door. Actually, I care about the number of people getting through the door, and I'm still trying to tweak that formula. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and then there's the money part, too. Like, oh, we gotta get money to do these things, so. But it's usually exhibits, educational programming. And I do, I take those things seriously, and I get them done. But I focus more of our attention on how can we hit a grand slam so that it has a huge impact. Thank you.